General, thanks for uh, speaking with us. We've uh, experienced a great Congress. Just wonder if you've got any impressions of it. Well, I enjoyed it. The most marvellous thing was to discover how many people I still know around here. Really? But also the encouraging thing was to see so many new faces as well. Good. That moment when the couple of hundred new soldiers were brought in, mm. that's the life of tomorrow, if you like to put it. Mm. That was the one of the highlights, I think, of the Congress. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, many of the folk, of course, couldn't get to Congress, and we're hoping through this um, through Newsline we'll be able to bring them some of your concepts and some of your thoughts that you shared with us over that Congress. Uh, since your election to the Office, office of General, we're wondering if God's given you any specific vision or insight for your term. Well, I suppose I've got several things that the Lord is saying to me, but one of them is certainly that we need to be more flexible, mm -hmm. we need to be adaptable, mm -hmm. uh, we need to take Catherine Booth's ideas seriously, because it was Catherine who said that the Army's success was based upon the great fundamental principle of adaptability, which means you don't change your aims, but you change your methods. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that's going to change the Army for the future as we refine a principle which we've largely lost. We've become a bit inflexible, mm -hmm. I fear. So uh, this concept of uh, flexibility and elasticity, mm -hmm. which you talked about, and I think there's many Salvationists would uh, applaud that sort of uh, approach to things, but is there a danger in that, that with flexibility comes license? Yes, of course there is. When you give your kid a bit of freedom, uh, there's a danger. They may make mm -hmm. the wrong kind of company, they may stay out too late in spite of your best advice, but you can't keep them in the cradle. They've mm -hmm. got to grow up. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the Salvation Army needs to be allowed to grow up. That is to say, sometimes to make mistakes, and that's a danger of flexibility, but to have the liberty to try new things uh, according to their own inspiration. Now, the old idea was that the leader had the inspiration. The Holy Spirit spoke to the, mm -hmm. the commissioner and he told them. Now, you see, th really, that's not a very good biblical basis because the Lord's willing to talk and communicate mm -hmm. with everybody. And sometimes he has such a job to get through to the commissioner or the general that he finds the captain or the comrade Mm -hmm. to speak to. And I think we've got to allow that possibility that the Holy Spirit doesn't only speak through the hierarchical system of the army, which he may not even have noticed. Uh, <laughs> he, he comes through anybody that's open on the Godwood side with a new idea or a new approach. And the flexibility comes in recognizing that fact and allowing it to happen. Of course, there's a danger. People can go over the top and do mm -hmm. something stupid. Mm -hmm. That's always possible. But I think the, the motive is the thing. If the motive for the innovation or the change, or the exception, is to win souls, or to grow saints, or to serve suffering humanity, then it's probably right, and the inspiration is of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we might fall over, but if, we, if we're scared to fall over, we'll always stand still. Mm -hmm. General, every few days there arrives on my desk here at THQ, uh, either minutes, or amendments to minutes, <laughs> or a new set of regulations. Uh, doesn't it seem that flexibility is a curious concept in an army that's sort of uh, so rigid in some ways? Well, we have far too many regulations, there's no doubt about it. And some people have a passion for them, you know. I absolutely uh, I can't understand how somebody can love uh, laying down laws all the time. I remember years ago in Great Britain we were starting drama groups all over the place and somebody said, well, now we must have some morals and regulations for drama. <laughs> I said, what for? <laughs> drama is a creative thing. If you start caging it, it'll die. You can't to chain everything down and have a uniform system for everything. But you can establish guidelines and core principles, when I core C-O-R-E yeah, uh, yeah. principles. And I think that that's what regulations sh should be. And a more generous interpretation of, uh, of order and regulations that exist is called for. So what I'd like to see, I don't know if I'm going to achieve this, because mm -hmm. the idea that the general does what he likes is, is an illusion. But uh, one of the things I'd like to see is a simplification of orders and regulations and an admission that exceptions to rules can be permitted in exceptional circumstances. Uh, if you push me I could probably give you an example or two but I do think that uh, if we're too rigid we don't allow the Holy Spirit to do his exceptional thing. Mm -hmm. We're so keen on tidiness, you know, everything's, it's so, it's so nice, it's so organized and the Holy Spirit didn't seem to, to score tidiness very <laughs> the wind blows where it wants to blow and takes us where perhaps we've not really thought of going. But that's the liberty we must give to the Spirit, even if we have a framework of guidelines uh, through which we work. 
So, General, am I hearing you correct to say that you see orders and regulations more as guidelines than fixed parameters? Uh, that's the way forward, I'm sure of that. Right, okay. I'm sure it is. Because one of the problems we have with our regulations, and you know, you, you, you really have put me on a, a very interesting spot. One of the problems we have with our regulations is that they, are, they have a tendency to be universally applied. Mm -hmm. That is to say, in whatever country or whatever culture, we, we want to apply the same regulations, which is, if I might say so, without appearing to criticize our forebears, uh, a little silly because the situation in a different country or a different culture demands a different kind of uh, guideline mm -hmm. or, or uh, fl uh, flexible interpretation of a guideline at least. What the Indian territories need and what the territories need uh, in America or in Alaska or Honolulu or Manchester, England, there's a certain difference mm -hmm. Because their methods have to be different to meet the needs of the people they're trying to serve. So we've got to allow a little difference. If we lay things down black and white, we won't allow for this cultural interpretation, which I think in an international movement is absolutely necessary. Of course you can say to me, as you probably would if I gave you a moment to speak, <laughs> you would say to me, but that's dangerous too. It is dangerous. Yes, it is. There's always a danger that we'll finish up with, a, with uh, 20 Salvation Armies. No, we've got to keep the unity of the army, but in a diversity within it, a diversity of methods and approaches and interpretations that suit the culture. I come back to my old principle, it's what will serve the mission of the Salvation Army that has to decide mm -hmm. how, the, how the rules are going to be. Mm -hmm. Let me paint you a picture then. Mm -hmm. We have two corps. Core A is very traditional, has a large band, songsters, and if I wish to participate in the worship music in that corps, I must be first a Christian, experience conversion, secondly a uniform Salvationist, and a member of the music section. That's what's required. Mm -hmm. Core B, say a few kilometres down the road, is a contemporary core where perhaps the uh, keyboard player is not even a Christian, but uh, is involved in the worship, uh, the, the music, the worship service. So here we have two completely different standards. Uh, is that what's going to happen? I, I am afraid it is. <laughs> right. okay. I, I, I've often preached, and you may have heard me preach it, that uh, no two core should be the same. Right. They need to adapt their methods or their, their arrangement, their structure, their program to the need of where they happen to be. And uh, it, will, it will mean different places, mm -hmm. uh, different styles. Um, I was talking to, I'm sure they won't mind me saying the core, I was talking to the officers from Pine Rivers mm -hmm. Corps. Now I visited Pine Rivers mm -hmm. and I saw what they called the community band, you sure. see. Now nobody needs to sign anything to get into that except a bit of willingness to do a bit of work and to learn properly. And now I spoke to the envoy because we joked about it a little when I was there some years ago. Mm -hmm. And he was able to tell me of the numbers yes. of bandsmen who came and girls that came and joined that band and have now found the Lord and made a Christian mm -hmm. commitment. So there they are using the band as an outreach <coughs> program, mm -hmm. whereas in the other corps they're using it as a service program, mm -hmm. a way of expressing one's love for God by serving in an evangelical uh, musical style. The two are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I've been going to publish it. You, you encouraged me to do it. I came across some, some writings in which uh, the father of Salvation Army Music, who was Lieutenant Colonel Slater, wrote to Bramwell Booth, I think it was, saying that he foresaw the day when there would be within the music structure of the army, which he had been utilised to create, really, all kinds of, uh, of music, and he said he could see how a band, a brass band, would become kind of ambidextrous, that it would not produce one kind of music, mm -hmm. that sometimes it would be much more uh, modern, much more worldly, if you like, use even different mini instruments. Mm -hmm. He foresaw the joystrings before the joystrings yes. were made, and you know the joystrings are uh, part of history. But when they were introduced, all the, the sections, so that's terrible, that, that stuff. But Slater, as far back as that, uh, Slater was very early in the mm -hmm. history of it, foresaw this idea when we'd have a variety of music styles within the, the uh, uh, core. Mm -hmm. But it's true that 
basically, I think a core must decide what it's going to use the thing for, what is its aim. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, I suppose, in most traditional core, the aim of the band is to allow the gifts of a, of a soldier to express themselves through music and also to outreach their, their district in musical ways. So they need a certain structure for that. Yeah. But if you're going to use the, the band as a, an outreach program, uh, that is to say a way of winning people closer to the army mm. so the Lord can get hold of them, then you need a totally different structure. You can't have the same structure mm. in that sector. So I say, let them, you right. see. And the, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating, and it seems that where uh, the, the motive is right mm -hmm. and clear, it works in both, in both cases. Yeah. So this is a sort of a prime example of the flexibility yeah, working out. Yeah, yeah. Will you be communicating your message of flexibility to territorial commanders and other leaders throughout the army world? Yes, I, I, I will, and I am. <laughs> I think. I think. Well, I don't know if it's fair to say this, but I hope that the High Council, when they elected me, <laughs> knew what they were doing. I think they did. Sure they, they, they knew that they knew that if they if they put me in, in the job, mm -hmm. that they would have this kind of approach, right. so that they knew what they were letting themselves in for. I'm not really expecting them to hold up their hands in horror if I talk about flexibility and the need for change and adaptability, mm -hmm. because that's me, and that's what they put in. Right. <laughs> right. They have to take the packet. <laughs> General, moving to a different question, what do you see as one of the main strengths of the Salvation Army? It's people, really. You know, the people call, I, I look at your territory, the people called Salvationists are among the most gifted people in the world. We're always running ourselves down, pretending that something's better on the other mm. side of the fence than other churches do better, they do. They've got more and all this kind of stuff. The richness of the Salvation Army in its people mm -hmm. is superb. We've got every kind of possible person, mm -hmm. which means that if we deploy those people properly, we can reach every kind of possible person. Mm -hmm. If we try to produce one kind of Salvationist with one kind of outlook, we'll only reach one kind of person with our message. But because of the rich variety, it's, uh, it's possible to reach a much wider spectrum of, of people. I'm not just thinking of professional gifts or talents, I'm thinking of personality gifts. Mm -hmm. um, some people can communicate love, some people can love it, they can't communicate mm -hmm. it. Some people, uh, they, they feel it and they can communicate it. Now that's a gift of the mm -hmm. spirit. We must encourage very ordinary people to discover what their thing is, that where their strength lies and cultivate it and invest it. And I think if we can dis, uh, deploy the existing forces, we shall be, have more success and we shall have more people to de dis deploy. Well, you've heard me on this one before. I'm basically a convinced Christian stewardship man. And when I see the huge resource of the army, especially in this territory that I love, it's, it's underexploited, it's mm -hmm. underemployed, it's half mobilized, you see. So I come back to my old theme that what the army needs to do is to mobilize its huge potential, but particularly the potential that exists in its people, right. especially in its young people. We mm -hmm. keep saying, oh, they'll grow out of it because they're difficult or something. We don't want them to grow no, out of no, it. We, don't, we do want it. them to be what God wants them to yes. be now. Yeah. We not need that enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. they add something. Mm. They're like a powerhouse. Yes, it's right. And we're, mm. we're, not, we're not tapping into it as we could. Mm. I mean, well, there are, exce there are exceptions to everything. There mm. are areas where great things happen. But there's a large area where they're not using mm -hmm. the resources, and that's mm. that. What's the greatest danger to the Army? Oh, I think I've mentioned that before. It's diversion, to be diverted from its main principles into pleasant but not particularly useful things. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that is to lose the motive. Often we start something useful or good with a view to, coming back to my three principles, either win souls or to grow saints or so, but it becomes a, a reason for its own existence and it forgets what it was created for and that's a pity. I think a lot comes to motives. If the army reminds itself constantly that everything it does leads to one of these three main objects or contributes to success in that area, it can be very obliquely or indirectly, mm. but, but it contributes something to those three things. If we constantly uh, refuse to be diverted from those main aims, I think the army's got a future that will sparkle. 
what can this territory contribute to the worldwide army? Oh, that's a good question. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. I'll tell you what it can produce. First of all, ideas. Right. The idea that everything creative uh, is in the other side of the world is a lot of nonsense. There's plenty of creativity down under. And they have some good ideas there. That, for example, the public relations system, the interpretation of the army to the community, mm -hmm. is as good here as anywhere in the world and probably a, a bit better. So there's expertise. But the thing that I really would say is it's people. Now, I won't say that Salvationists in Australia are parochial, because they're not. They mm -hmm. travel a lot. But what I would love to see is much more an infiltration into other territories in the world of representatives of the Australian territories. I've always been for exchange in mm -hmm. office, three years, five years. In fact, I think in these days when mobility is, is easy, uh, and things can be arranged that every intelligent officer should expect to work three years, five years, sometime during his career in some other part of the world right. for the enrichment of that part of the world and for his own enrichment. But I would, I, I can't say I'll people the Salvation Army well with Australians. I don't think I get enough of them to do that. But it, I do wish that small Australians would accept the idea of volunteering for service, mm -hmm. not just in third world countries. I'm thinking in uh, f first world countries very much as mm -hmm. well, the sophisticated territories, as well as the more simple structures. They have something to contribute mm -hmm. that is uh, it's hard to define, right? but it's, it's valuable. Try and define it for well, us. Well, it's, uh, <sighs> it's informality, for mm -hmm. one thing. I think we've got so formal in the army, mm -hmm. and an Australian isn't normally naturally formal. Right. He is disarming, that's the word, right. so, sometimes charming, but disarming mm -hmm. by his naturalness and his sitting lightly uh, to uh, structures or to uh, the ranks and all this guy, kind of thing. It's a relaxed approach, mm -hmm. which I think is extremely healthy, and the rest of the world could do with a little bit uh, of, uh, of that. The other thing is his determination. I wouldn't say stubborn or pig-headed, because I wouldn't dare to say that, but he has determination. When he sees something, he goes for it, and he doesn't let people get in his way. Mm -hmm. Now, I think some of that is, is, is exportable, mm -hmm. and I'd like to see it exported into, into the world. Mm. On the other hand, of course, because of its geographical position, it is very important that you have officers coming to Australia from outside. They bring something with them and they carry something away with them right. when they go. Now while I was here I tried to cultivate that. We had a couple of couples from, uh, from Canada. We had a guy from Switzerland and so on. I think it's important this, this mixing. Mm -hmm. It's mutually beneficial. Uh, it's good for Australia and it's good for the officers who experience Australia. Most of them fall in love with it. I mean, look at me. <laughs> General, I've heard you say it a number of times, uh, to save souls, grow saints, and serve suffering humanity. Now, is this going to be the theme well, it's going to be for the your theme. generalship? It is. I'm going to sing that song right. e everywhere. There are modifications to it. Mm -hmm. There will be ornaments to it, I've no doubt. One of the things I've already mentioned is to those three things, I would, a I would add the need to mobilise our total resources. But they're all part of these, the, mm -hmm. these, these three things. But I'm afraid so. I've only got three years. Uh, it's no good confusing the issues by blowing several trumpets at once. I think this is the theme, and I hope that the army will respond to it. I get mm. good vibrations so far, which right. encourages. Yes. Anything that needs to particularly happen to see these, um, uh, this vision come to place? Well, it's, uh, it's a need for courage. You see, there's security in things that are, mm. but it's a false security. Because if you say, well, uh, the earthquake is coming, I've got my little house, I'm going to close the windows, <laughs> there's a sense of security behind the windows, but when that earthquake comes, it won't matter, your little thing. It, it isn't an answer, it's a <laughs> false security. So I think to stay as we are, without uh, becoming more versatile, more varied, more flexible, more imaginative, and to keep the army as it is, and protect it from any change or influence, uh, is the way for, for a funeral. It's not, it's not the way forward. We need courage. And uh, I think there, there's a feeling abroad, uh, I may be kidding myself, it's possible, 
because I'd like to feel it's true, but I do feel it's true. There's a feeling abroad that this is the time mm -hmm. when we ought to take things a little more uh, courageously, adventurously. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe uh, if that's so, then the army's got a marvellous future. Mm -hmm. I love the army, and I think uh, if I had a, a call to make to the Salvationists generally, it would be stop picking at the army and criticising it. It's not faultless, it's got its weaknesses, but it's God-inspired. And God wants to use it even more, more uh, than He's doing now. So love the army in spite of mm. its faults, and uh, put your investment in God's work through God's army, mm. please. <laughs> John Gowden's hadn't been called to be a Salvation Army officer. Mm -hmm. What would he have been? Well, people often ask me that. They think I'd be a, be a politician or an actor, which is a, a, neither of which is particularly <laughs> flattering. But <laughs> no, I don't know what I would have been. I intended to be a teacher, as you probably know. I was ready for teacher training when I came into training as an officer. But what would I have become? I don't know, but I'm sure of this. I would have become something less, mm -hmm. something less useful, and that would have been a pity. I don't regret becoming an officer. I'm sure my life would have been yet less useful, less beautiful in its way, less fulfilling. I don't regret for a day. Of course, there are times when you get fed up with the army and you say, my goodness me, I wish the, the thing was, you know, something else. But it, it, in spite of its weaknesses and despite the things that happen in the life of an army officer, and it's not all bed of roses, as you know, mm. but in spite of all that, I'm totally sure that this is the right way for me and I don't mm. regret in any serious way taking this, this road. I would have been something else, but it wouldn't have been as fulfilling mm -hmm. as the life I've had. So officership for you has been a very fulfilling experience? It has. Mm -hmm. I know some people don't find that, mm. and I, 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 but I have to give my own testimony sure. and say that of course I've had appointments I didn't want. Mm. I sometimes felt my uh, leaders misunderstood me. I'm sure they did. They, they thought I was a dangerous man because I would say what was in my mind. But the honest man is not necessarily the dangerous mm. one. I've had conflicts occasionally, misunderstandings now and then, appointments that I didn't particularly enjoy. But through it all, there's been this quiet conviction that the hand of the Lord has been on me, and uh, he has chosen the weak things of this world to mm. confound the mighty. So I qualify, because I'm weak enough. <laughs> <laughs> General, from one who's had a long experience of officership, what would you say to young people contemplating officership? Well, they're scared, you know. I t when I was here, I invited a lot of young people, uh, by letter first of all, to consider officership. And I suggested to them, if any of them wanted to talk to me mm. about it, to come talk. Now, I was amazed. I should think I sent a hundred letters out, but I must have had fifty or sixty interviews. Really? They came to see me. Now, they weren't all the same, but there was so they had something in common. When I pried about their hesitancy mm. about officership, they were all, although they expressed it differently, they were all scared that officership would be a narrow experience that didn't exploit their gifts properly or allow their personality to develop. They, they thought officership was important and, uh, and uh, we need officers, but they saw officership as a, you know, cribbed, cabined and confined kind of, of experience where uh, there was no liberty. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who's given them that. Maybe it's us officers. Mm. We, we often talk about our constraints and we never talk about our liberties. So we may have given them this idea. And I had to spend a lot of time saying that no, the reverse is the case, especially in the important works in charge of an institution or in charge of a corps. Your liberties are enormous. Mm. In fact, it's when you get up, up the ladder, as they call it, that your liberties are reduced and they, that you're so, you're so cribbed, cabined and yes. confined. But seriously, when I, when I was a captain in the Salvation Army, I was extremely free and I was allowed to be. And on the the idea that we don't develop our personalities, that's not been my experience, mm -hmm. not at all. And I'm sure that if I'd become something else, I wouldn't have developed the me 
-hmm. that I am. Mm -hmm. So I, I can only be grateful to them. They gave me opportunities that were mm -hmm. crazy. They really did. Mm -hmm. at, at a comparatively young age, I had responsibilities. And then when I started to write, they encouraged me. Mm -hmm. and they, they encouraged me. I've written ten musicals with, with John Larson, and I never wrote one saying, well, perhaps somebody will use it. The army said, write one for this, write one for this. They encouraged mm. me. Mm. And mm. I've developed a gift that I didn't really know mm -hmm. I had, thanks to the army. The idea that officership is... And I did all those things while I was a corps officer or a DYS or something. Not, not, <laughs> not in some little office, you know, with, a, with nothing else to do but that. Yes. You do it alongside the job, yes. but you have the liberty to do it. Uh, is there a sense here in, in which being at the coal face inspires that sort of creativity? Oh, it does. Mm. I, I believe the most creative people are the people in the court. Yes. Because they're, they're, they're stimulated by the, the... Well, you look at... I, you know, they laugh at me because I say, when I come to a Congress or something, for goodness sake, put the lights on. I want to see who I'm talking to. But they do stimulate you, mm. you see. Mm. Yeah. They are part of the creative mm. process. Yes. A good sermon is not a, a solo. It's a, it's a dialogue. Yes. And they, they speak. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation. Mm. Mm. And I think that in the creative processes of the army, we need to allow people to, to stimulate us mm -hmm. who are their leaders because they tell you sometimes where they need to be taken. Right. General, no doubt you have visited some of the developing countries in the world and um, you find there a great sense of freedom, enthusiasm, a sense of explosive growth, especially in some of the uh, Asian and African countries. How can we transport that sort of thing to the Western Salvation Army? It's very difficult because of the cultural differences. But to a degree, it comes back to that idea that we've talked about already, that idea of exch exchanges. Mm -hmm. I think that some officers from third world countries can bring into the first world countries uh, uh, that spirit mm -hmm. which is contagious. If the, the transferring officers, or soldiers even, are carefully selected so that the, the, the fusion of the two cult cultures isn't damaging, I think that may be the way forward. For example, we were a long time in France, and France, the army in France, has been enormously helped in recent years by the influx, there's not another word, of uh, salvationists from French-speaking Africa, yeah. the two Congos, and uh, there are two or three of the corps in Paris that are almost totally, totally black, and others where they have African salvationists who've transferred to France. And their sparkle, their mm -hmm. enthusiasm, yes. has been contagious. Yes. And France is the better territory today for the arrival in its midst of people who were less negative, uh, more positive about uh, the power of the Lord to do things that would be impossible without him. And yeah. that does, does work. Yeah. But uh, it's a big question, that mm. one. I wish we could package it and send it over. It would be great. Wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> General John Gowans, we thank you for spending this time with us. And we as the salvationists in your old territory, wish you all the best and we'll be praying for you and your very heavy responsibility. God bless you. Thank you.